Hello, YouTube, and welcome to my run of the beginner's guide. I'm very excited to bring this to you. I played this game in 2018 when I very first started streaming. And at the time of this playthrough, it is nearly six years later. Um, and I don't remember any of it. It was at a time where when I was live streaming, I was interacting with chat more than I was paying attention to the game. And I take a little bit of a different approach to my playthroughs now, as you know, if you've been watching my other playthroughs. So I'm really excited to play this and experience the game for what it is in the format that I now use when I stream and when I create this YouTube content. So throw me a thumbs up, leave me a comment if you have things that you'd like to say about the playthrough. I don't know how many parts it'll be, maybe one, maybe two. And uh, I will pause and chat about what's happening in the points where it feels good to do that. I don't know where that will be. But uh, this is, it's not a fully blind run, but it's as blind of a run as it can be having played the game before. It's been a long time. So, without further ado, thanks so much for all of your support of my playthroughs. I appreciate it immensely, and I hope you'll like this one as much as I'm going to like playing it for you. Audio is on. Cool. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you very much for playing The Beginner's Guide. You're welcome. My name is Davey Reedon. I wrote The Stanley Parable. And while that game tells a pretty absurd story, today I'm going to tell you about a series of events that happened between 2008 and 2011. We're going to look at the games made by a friend of mine named Coda. Now these games mean a lot to me. Uh, I met Coda in early 2009 at a time when I was really struggling with some personal stuff, and his work pointed me in a very powerful direction. I found it to be a good reference point for the kinds of creative works that I wanted to make. So just to start you off, this is, I think, the first game he ever made. It's a level for Counter-Strike. You can walk around here, by the way. And uh, mostly it's just Coda learning the basics of building a 3D environment. But what I like is that even though he starts from the simple aesthetic of a desert town, he then scatters these colorful abstract blobs and impossible floating crates around the level. And of course, it destroys the illusion that this actually is a desert town, and instead this level becomes a kind of calling card from its creator. It's like a reminder that this video game was constructed by a real person. And it kind of makes you wonder, what was going through his head as he was building this? This is what I like about all of Coda's games. I mean, not that they're all fascinating as games, but that they are all going to give us access to their creator. I want us to see past the games themselves. I want to get to know who this human being really is. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So, it's 2008, Coda starts making these games, and he never releases any of them. He doesn't put them onto the internet, he just makes them and then immediately abandons them and they sit on his computer forever. And I think he really understood this image of himself as a recluse. Uh, at one point he jokingly renamed his computer's recycling bin to Important Games Folder. So, you know, this was just how he worked. He tended to crank them out one after the other without even really pausing to try to understand what he had just made. Until suddenly one day, he just stopped. In 2011, that was it. He made his last game and then he hasn't made another one since. And that's why I've taken this opportunity to gather all of his work together, is because I find his games powerful and interesting, and I'd like this collection to reach him, to maybe encourage him to start creating again. And if the people like you who play this also happen to find his work interesting, then I'm sure it'll just send that much stronger of a message of encouragement to Coda. So thanks for joining me on this. If you have a particular interpretation that I haven't mentioned here, or if you just need to get in touch, you can email me at d-a-v-e-y-w-r-e-d-e-n at gmail.com. Okay, that's about it for introduction. Let's take a look at Coda's first proper game. As each game is loading, I'll show you the date that it was completed. This first one was made in November 2008. Okay, 
Uh, I'm going to do this so that you don't have to stare at a white screen while I talk about the very beginning of this. Because there's already an immense amount of fascinating stuff that my brain is worrying on. Um, I am going to make the assumption that Coda is indeed a real person and that Davey is talking about Coda the person and is legitimately interested in exploring Coda the person. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Davey's referring to himself and it's this whole thing. But for now, I'm going to make the assumption that Coda is a real person that we're exploring via his games. Uh, point number one that I find to be really interesting is the idea that a creative work is a reflection of the creator. That is indeed true in the sense that I've always found this to be like existentially fascinating. And there's no better uh, example of this than Mass Effect Andromeda, in my opinion. And I'll talk about that in a second. But essentially, the idea is that we only have the ability to create things that are products of what has been represented to us, that our brain is not capable of understanding anything that it hasn't come across or can't create symbolic interactions between. So the idea that you could think of something new that no brain has ever thought of before is very difficult because, or potentially impossible because even if I thought of like a blue alien wearing a something something, the alien itself, though original in and of its original in its creation, is still an amalgam of things that the brain understands figuratively. So the idea would be that like if this alien has legs or appendages, the idea of an appendage is a idea or concept that our brain has borrowed from having appendages represented to us via our visual field and whatnot, and our own experience of having appendages. And so your any sort of uniqueness that you're going to have is going to be the way in which you combine things that have been represented to you. So in that way, when you see creations by an artist, in this case a video game, what you're seeing is what is conscious to that person when they're trying to represent something that they understand or think they understand in some way. So in this way, we get a look into what Coda has conceptualized as a desert environment in a video game, and there's boxes and colors and textures and sounds and stuff, but all of that, none of that is actually like original. The combination itself is original. And Coda is not going to insert anything into his environment that he's never come across before in his entire life. So, for example, if in that desert environment there is, let's say that like in, in a country, I don't know, let's say in Nepal, there's an, in, actually, I just read about this recently. Let's say there's, there's this island volcanic whatever thing in the ocean where there's this stick bug that only exists on this one island. And... Until a week ago when I read about the Wikipedia article about this bug, I never knew that this bug existed. So if I had ever created an island environment, I never would have created that specific stick bug because I didn't know it existed. I may have created an insect that looks something similar to it, but that's because I've seen insects that look like sticks in other environments that maybe I think could fit the bill for that. Or maybe I take something that wouldn't be in that environment, like a polar bear, and I put it in the desert and I say it works. And then other people go, that doesn't work because of the way I've seen a polar bear represented. This is a very long way, essentially, of me saying that, like, creativity in art is absolutely a window not just into the creator, but it's a window into what has been represented to a creator and what they've taken away and connected to the symbols and figures that are in the environments or that they have bor borne witness to. And I find that to be so interesting. And so if what we're going into is a representation of the things that are in Coda's mind, we're going to see the types of things that were represented to him and the connections that he made as a result of that. Very cool. Now, that said, Danny is hijacking this a bit 
because if Coda created these things and threw them away because they didn't mean anything to him, what we're seeing is Davy's projections being put into these games by the suggestion that Coda would care to create more things if he got external validation via interest from the things he created. And that may not have even been why he created those things in the first place. So there's a huge assumption being made about his friend here that may or may not be true. And in that way, the external validation may not land in the way that he thinks because that's not the purpose for why Coda created the things that he created. So curiosity into Coda's mind, cool. Trying to convince Coda to create more games based on what he learns from these potentially seems a little bit odd to me. White screen warning. Warning, whisper machine status active. Evacuate immediately. Oh, I have a gun. This game is called Escape from Whisper, and it's one of the more generic games you'll see from Coda. Also, Davy's determination of what order to show these games in is likely going to bias our perception of Coda. It's a very, that's another thing that's very important uh, to realize is that like we're seeing Coda through the eyes of Davy, which means we don't have an unbiased view of Coda's consciousness here. You it's being represented to, to us gun. in a particular order. Very Halo vibes. Security call breached. Hostile alien life forms inbound. It kind of looks like this game was abandoned mid development. <laughs> For instance, you have this gun, which you'd think would indicate that there are supposed to be monsters or enemies somewhere, but then clearly there are no enemies anywhere. You can't even reload the gun when you run out of bullets. But ultimately, we don't really know. Maybe Coda thought that actually it was complete the way that it is. And I think that we should talk about his games for what they are, rather than for what they're not. I would agree. Because what he's talking about is our projection of assumptions about what a game should be that we all bring our own biases as observers and as players into our expectations of what a particular environment is. So, yeah. What we want it to be is no longer part of what Coda's, what our understanding of Coda is. And again, I'm taking this game right now as this is an exploration of his friend Coda. And so what Coda created and what he didn't create there's an infinite amount of possibilities on what he didn't create. And so what does it tell us? Looking at what we have versus what we wish we had is a very important thing just in general, that you should always work with what you have rather than your projections or perceptions of what you think should be available in a thing. So this, maybe you're just a dude with a gun in a space station. Maybe it's not even about shooting aliens. It's about preparedness or the emptiness or what it would the experience would be like to have a weapon that you might have to use but don't. Like We don't know the intention behind the environment that was created. We only know what's available. And so the cool thing is we don't get a lot of insight into Coda. We only get insight into what, again, has been represented to him and what he concretely created. We're going to get way more insight into ourselves. And this is how I encourage all of you to watch this playthrough because it's how I'm going to play it as well is we're gonna get insight into ourselves based on what it is that we're expecting or what we're looking for, what disappoints us, what doesn't, what intrigues us, what doesn't. You're gonna get a lot of insight in yourself. Like when I'm walking around here holding a gun in like a space level that reminds me of Halo and there's no aliens, am I disappointed that there are no aliens to shoot when I have a gun to shoot them at? Well, that says something more about me than it does Coda, which again, I find interesting. And yes, I forgot to mention the Andromeda thing. Uh, Andromeda being the best example of the limitations of the scope of creativity of humans, 
the thing that always bothered to me bothered me about Andromeda and why I knew that the game conceptually was never going to work for me from the outset is because we have no way collectively as humans of anticipating what life forms or planetary structures or whatever would exist in the Andromeda galaxy. Like we have some idea of like the physics of it and like we have general conceptualization of planets and stuff. But when EA decided to take Mass Effect to Andromeda, they bit off more than they can chew. And so when you come across in the very first level, biped life forms that shoot guns, it really rings hollow for me because it suggests that that's really the only lane of evolution that could have existed. And that idea that we would run into that on Andromeda, I mean, it's just soaked with limitations of the human brain. And I couldn't get myself away from that while I was playing Andromeda. So that's, a, to me, a perfect example. We couldn't create something out of nothing. You couldn't create something that was so unique that we would be mind blown by it because literally anything you created was limited by the scope of the human brain's ability to represent something in the Andromeda galaxy. Anyway. All right, so we're in space. Speaking of Andromeda Galaxy. I love how you can see the bottom of the universe from this room. <laughs> yeah. It's just interesting because he's looking at these games as incomplete, and perhaps Coda might say that they are complete and that they're exactly what he wants them to be. And I'm out of ammo. I just want to admire the space skybox for a second here. Shit. What the hell? Oh, now this door opens. Right, so now I'm carrying Apparently a gun with no ammo. the space station has a labyrinth on it. I... Uh... Sure, I don't know. There's really no reason for it that I've ever been able to discern, so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip you on. No! No! Don't do that! No! Or, if you'd really like to solve the labyrinth, you're welcome to do that, too. Yeah, I'm fascinated by this, because think of the tension. Right? Like, now you're in a spaceship. I'm in a space station. There's some sort of threat that I don't understand. I have a gun. I'm out of ammo. I'm now in a labyrinth in a space station that I theoretically am supposed to be able to go through. If I was this dude, I would be terrified. Also, I'm not paying attention. Right, so then, is the fact that there's nothing here disappointing or relieving? Because now that I've gone and checked all corners of the room and seen nothing, now do I know that I'm okay? Like, really fascinating, right? Like, anyway. I'm just going to talk through my stream of consciousness while I do this, because I'm quite interested in how all of this is put together. Okay, this is the part that's interesting. The game has this narrative about the whisper machine and how it has to be turned off, and then you get to the engine room. Right, so bias. Davey's telling us that now it's interesting, as if it wasn't interesting before. That because it was incomplete, so far as Davey evaluates completion, it's not as interesting as this specific plot point in the game. So again, we're not learning about Coda here. 
we're seeing a level that Coda created in a way that he conceptualized it, but we're seeing more of Davy's bias. It, it is Davy, right? I keep seeing Davy. I can't remember if it's Davy or Danny. I think it's Davy. We're seeing Davy's bias about what's interesting and what's not, and then he's imparting hey, that onto us. You there in the engine room? You could save us all. That beam is powering a whisper machine. We could disrupt it by introducing a great enough heat signature. If you, your body could stop the beam. It's so much to ask, but for all of our lives, would you do it? Could you give yourself? Oh well, is my life me being trapped for the remainder of my existence in this, this room? This is not a branching point, unfortunately. The only option is to step into the beam. <laughs> Sacrifice as a potential choice, yet not necessarily. It is a choice. I could sit here and just die in this room. I really didn't want to end it. Just sit in this room for all eternity. Right? So now I have a forced narrative here. I could stop playing the game if I don't want to go on the beam, but then have I essentially killed this person's existence as well? The illusion of... Well, there is choice, but... I just like how that person made the request, and... I must go if I want this to continue. Let me pause here for a second. What you just experienced, stepping into the beam and then dying, is probably what Coda had initially intended when he was developing this level. But when he first compiles and plays it, something goes wrong. There's a bug somewhere. And this is what happens instead. Okay. <laughs> you just returned. Oh, God. Oh, geez. Oh, that's so cool. You can see the whole, like, level design. The beam the causes beginning. you to start floating. And this is an important moment for him. Because, yes, this is technically a glitch, but Coda identifies something human about it, like how small it makes you feel in the face of this larger chaotic system. Or this floating could be the afterlife, a peaceful place, juxtaposed against all of the hysteria that you've just had to traverse. I, I don't even know. Uh, I have no idea what he was thinking, but what's clear is that after making this, something lodges itself in his brain. He wants to do more of these really weird and experimental designs. So he stops work on this and moves on to a stream of tiny little games that go in all sorts of directions. That's a hell of an assumption, Davey. I don't know about you, but if I'm Coda, I would be annoyed if this is the way that my friend was trying to understand me. Because he's making a huge amount of assumptions based on the way that he is experiencing what Coda developed. We don't know that Coda decided, ooh, this is really interesting and this bug has inspired me to do a bunch of extra things. It very well could have been that Coda couldn't figure out the bug and was just so frustrated that he decided to make other stuff as a way to distract himself from how annoyed he is that his magnum opus isn't going to go forward because he can't figure out the bug. Which would tell us, if that was the case, and Coda said, nah, dude, I wasn't, like, inspired by this. I was frustrated by it. I made these other games in spite of it. That tells us more about Coda than whatever Davy's perception of it is based on what it is that he's experienced. So we are absolutely being biased in our understanding of Coda by Davy's interpretation of it. I just if I'm if I'm Coda, I'm annoyed. Because <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're, you're, you're making a hell of a lot of assumptions on me, bud. 
let's go ahead and take a look at the first game he made after leaving this one behind. Oh god, this is like the Microsoft screensaver. The past was behind her. Yep. In this game, you can only walk backwards. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Oh, this is great. What are these holes in the floor? Oh, man. But the future could so not be seen. So it's a short and relatively minimalist experiment combining motion and narrative. It is less advanced than the previous game, but actually it seems to be more focused, more complete. Code is trying to give it a unique voice rather than simply basing it on a pre-existing trope. All right, I'm going to have to get over my Davies making assumptions thing because that's going to drive me nuts. And I'm going to keep bringing it up every time. But... Right, less advanced, right, like, how, how do we know that? Keep changing. Feels like a joke build, right. So this is the thing that I love, right? And I really, I, I can't emphasize this enough, friends. Like, as you're watching this, I really, I really hope that all of you will pay attention to your own reactions to the things that happen in this game. Like, what do you see when we play this? Do you see junk code? Do you see a possible creative, like a, a conceptual, uh, what am I trying to think of? Uh, like a concept environment. Uh, do you see somebody who was frustrated? Do you see somebody who wanted to frustrate the person who plays? Is this a reflection? I mean, th there's so many ways that we could go in terms of trying to understand what this is. Why does the future keep changing? But the future cannot be seen. Why does the future keep changing? <laughs> when she stops and looks, it becomes clearer. But if the future is always behind her, how will she find the strength to confront it? It's a short little thought. It says what it wants to say, and then it ends. Didn't need anything more than that. No, Dave! Which to me is why it works, because it gets out quick. Okay, next one. Davey. Give me a chance to ponder. I mean, I, I mean, my my reaction to that, to an extent, is like it sounds like there's just a lot of like oxymorons put in there to make it sound like it's deep. Uh, I, why did he just pull us out of that? I would have loved to have talked more about that. <laughs> well, that's okay. Let's learn more about Coda, Davy. All right, we got fog of war on this. Davey has a preferred pace. Yeah, right. You are now entering. He likes to do uh, messages in chunks, I see, as well. There's object permanence here. I'm so interested in this. What am I now entering? And that's it. Okay, the meaning of this game won't be clear just yet. Please be patient with me for a few more games, and I promise you'll see what makes it interesting. Okay. Oftentimes, Coda would put bizarre titles like this one at the start of his games. I wish I'd known him at the time that he was making these early games. He would really only talk to me about his work as he was making it. Once he stopped work on a game, like, that was it. It was dead to him. And I don't agree with that at all, but what are you going to do? Let it be, or I guess create an entire game that you share with the masses in order to intrude upon it. Feels like 
such a boundary violation. I like this. <laughs> like, like this guy didn't. I know ask. it's tempting, but there's actually nothing over here. Sorry. There's the edge of existence. I mean, it, this is how some artists work. You create a thing, and then you're done with it. It doesn't either isn't what you want it to be, or it's good enough, or you practice the thing. Like I think about this as basically being like doodles, maybe. If you're trying to figure out what kind of game you want to create and you just doodle some random conceptual things and then figure out what works and what doesn't. There's nothing wrong with that. And in some ways, like, I, I f always find it interesting that we look at things like this as being incomplete, that we look at a doodle as not finished enough, which really says more about what we all think about things being good enough or to our taste where we feel a sense of closure around it. Like, if Davey, if Davey releases this game to Steam and he says, this is the entire game, can we really look at it and say, this is an incomplete game? If Davey's telling you, this is the complete game. You are in a room with three rectangles, you walk upstairs and into a door, and that's the game. Is that incomplete? Or is it just not to a standard that you, the gamer, wants it to be? And does that Once make it any worse? Once you've to an absolute crawl, the door at the top of the stairs opens. So why, if code is not showing these games to anyone, why bother opening the door at all? Well, to show you, I'm modifying the game here so that when you press enter, it'll bring you back up to full speed so you can enter the door for yourself. But that's not the way the game was intended, Davey. We're seeing more of what Davey wants out of it than what Coda wanted out of it. Perhaps that's what Coda wants is for you to be so frustrated and patient that you walk up the stairs in this way. And, it's, <laughs> and so now it's like, do I embrace the temptation of playing this the way that Davey wants me to play it or do I play it the way that Coda wants me to play it? I'm sort of inclined to play this the way that Coda wants me to play it because Coda's the one that created the game. Perhaps there's a reason why we're supposed to slow crawl up this ladder. I get the idea this whole thing's more about Davey and his journey than it is about Coda's. It certainly seems to be the case. This is Davy's curiosity um, and lack of satiation around understanding what it is that Coda created for him. Or not even for him. I'm actually surprised that Davy's not, that Davy's not saying anything about the fact that we're doing this this way. And yes, I'm aware that there's certainly a chance, and I, there's a chance that Davey's just talking about himself. That's understandable. But... For now, I'm going to make the assumption that we're trying to understand Dakota. Or see them as two separate entities. But Coda did, see, here, Coda didn't block us from accessing this door. Coda just made it something that takes a long time to get to. Perhaps this is something that is a talk about patience and distress tolerance. You know, if you're somebody who's sitting here watching this and you just sped YouTube up to two times speed so that you didn't have to sit here and listen to this and watch this, does that say something about your level of patience for the way that a game was created? I mean, all of this stuff, just, it's, I, I love stuff like this because it begs all these questions. Here we go. I like viewing this game as an exercise of mental endurance too. Yeah. Imagine watching this at half speed. <laughs> Interesting that Davey only goes halfway with breaking the game. He didn't teleport us to the top of the stairs. He just gave us a way to speed it back up. Yeah. And so one of the things that we're learning about Davey here perhaps, is that there is a level of impatience around this type of game design. 
And there's a projection, the assumption that we, the person who he's talking to, share in his frustrations about Coda's designs. So we come across a labyrinth in the last space we were in, and Davy makes the assumption that we want to be fast forwarded through the labyrinth. Maybe because the labyrinth is too confusing. Maybe because he thinks that we're going to think it's boring or frustrating to navigate that. And that means that we're not going to finish it and hear the story that he has to say or whatever. So he fast forwards us through that to bypass it. Here, we run into a same thing. He sees something as being potentially slow and frustrating and annoying to the viewer. So he introduces a modification in order to speed it up, which then means that it's not being played the way that it was intended. So now we have two situations where we have not played the game the way that Coda may or may not have been intended it to be played because Davey inserted himself into it. He paused the game when we went into the beam and said that this was a glitch. I don't know. Maybe Coda intended for us to go into the beam and get launched up. I don't know. We're almost there. I'm going to be interested to see if it speeds me up when I get to the top here. Or if I actually have to hit enter in order to even regain my speed. What's in the room? I still move slow. Oh God. You start in a small room until you realize you can just walk through the walls. The game is nothing but giant blocks and text explaining what's happening. You are a gate, a series a of labs. A room that's warm and nice and filled with little ideas for games. A button you press to stop the chaos that doesn't work. A key in one game unlocks a door in a completely Coda separate game. Coda would often game. tell me that he didn't mind if people thought of him as cold or distant. He said that he knew that he was actually a vibrant and compassionate person, but that it takes time to really see that. It can be a very slow climb to get there. You walk around talking people down from pursuing their hopes and dreams. A normal game where you have to scream into a mic. Oh, let me read them, Davy. Oh. Ready, set, finish. Oh, Davy, you're killing me, buddy. Uh, unless, I don't know, maybe it's not Davey who's doing that. Maybe it's Coda. I don't know. There's so many cool ideas there. Okay, so now we're in what seems to be like a parking garage. With wooden stairs. Interesting. A Minecraft lever. Well, this is new for Coda. It's an actual puzzle. Go ahead and see if you can solve it. Okay. Maybe he intended to elicit the emotions when each experience is cut short. Very well could be the case. The reality is we don't know, which is why I remind us all this is about us, not about Coda or Davey even though they 
absolutely influence our perceptions of what it is that's happening. Because one created it, one's interpreting it. Okay, so you do this, open the door, and then... Oh, look at that. Don't forget that solution, because we're going to see this puzzle again soon. We're going to see it a lot. Okay. Love the music. So that seems to be it, right? You walk down a corridor, you solve the puzzle, you get to the end. Simple enough. All right, now I'm going to modify the game again so that when you press enter, it'll remove all of the walls from this room. Damn. How about that? There was more to it than we had any way of knowing. I actually find it funny that this game comes after the stairs game since they essentially convey the opposite idea. So uh, in the stairs game, a dull exterior concealed a rich interior. And then in this level, a dull interior hides this fantastic outer world. Either way, I think that the point is the same, is that most of the time you don't get to know what you're missing or even that you're missing anything. That's not your role as a player. So if your role here is not to understand, then what is it? That is a beautiful, beautiful question. Uh, and it is one that in a lot of ways was raised, I'm not gonna belabor this, uh, in the Stanley Parable playthrough, which I, if you're watching this and you didn't watch that, I encourage you to watch it, but um, is, when you go into certain experiences, not just in games, just in general, when you go into certain experiences and you don't know what to expect or what's coming or what's outside of your purview, and you are satisfied with that experience of what it is, have you lost out? if you never knew that that thing was there. If you were, I don't know, let's say that you were in a car dealership and you're waiting for your car to get serviced and at one point you decide to go use the restroom and at the time that you go to use the restroom, a person comes through the waiting room that for all we can tell would have been the absolute perfect match for you if you are you know, wanting to be in a long-term monogamous relationship, and that person gets pulled aside by one of the salespeople while you're in the restroom and you never meet that person, did you actually miss out because you didn't know that happened? Now, on a different side of the same coin, this is also really the power of staying in too homogenous of an area, whether it's physically or with certain people or with certain ideologies, where if you don't find ways to expand your representation of the world and different viewpoints and whatever, you will be locked into a quite myopic view of what certain things are or could be. And thus is the complex nature of our existence and I could talk for hours about that but I just you know this this whole moment here sort of embodies these concepts which I love were we meant to see these stairs you can't unsee them after they've been revealed to you Davy pops the walls back on we now know that there are staircases out there 
how does that affect our satisfaction with what we, it is that we saw prior to this? Because we could have looked at it and said, up until this point, well, that was the most satisfying level so far because it had a level of interaction. I had, I got to hit switches and I had to think through how to get through that door. To this point, that was the most stimulating environment, in my opinion, that I've been walking through. But then you show me this and I go, well, wait a second. Now is that disappointing to me? Is my satisfaction negated because I know that there are these staircases available to me? Has knowing that this exists ruined my experience in hindsight? All fascinating conversation or questions to ask yourself. Oh, thank God I and you take a step and it all goes away. Okay, so we're back here. So what do you got for me? Am I gonna hit enter and it's gonna reveal everything behind the fog of war? You are now exiting. Well, that's not what it said before. Aha. Uh -huh. So, this, combined with the entering game from earlier, tells us that Coda believes his games are connected somehow. It could even be that the stairs game and the puzzle game are literally connected in between this and the entering game. There's a bigger picture that all of his games are meant to play a role in, some larger meaning that we won't be able to grasp until we've seen all of them. And once we have, we can step back and start to understand what exactly that bigger picture is. Oh man, oh God, this is so good. This is so good. The human brain's desire to have answers, to have a nice, cogent, cohesive amalgam of all these things that we believe are related. The idea that there is some sort of meta transcendental thread of all these games may or may not actually be true. And it may actually be quite, I mean, it can absolutely for us as humans be difficult to manage the anxiety around when we can't figure out how things are related. And oftentimes we will look for ties that bind things so that we can anticipate them more effectively. So that we don't experience all sorts of crazy cognitive dissonance around it where we go, well, wait a second. So if we have this level and then we have this game, we have this game and we have this concept and this concept and we have one unifying creator, then perhaps we need to understand what the unification principle is in order to understand all of these when it very well could be that the intention behind all of these was that every single one of them exists in isolation and there is nothing that actually connects them. And in some ways we're being presented them in an order that suggests a level of cohesiveness when maybe they, we don't know that we're being presented these uh, serially in the way that Coda developed them or if Davey's putting them together in a particular type of way. At least I haven't gotten a sense of whether that's the case. But regardless, we tend to look for conclusions sometimes even when conclusions are not there to be drawn. And we actually can get ourselves in trouble when we do that because that leads us to thinking we know more about something than we may actually know, and curiosity is the way to cut through that. So rather than make an assumption about what it is that ties these together, we might want to be curious about whether that is even the case, and who is best equipped to inform us about whether there is something connected here, because there may not be. We may not be gaining any insight into Coda's thought process at all by doing this, because perhaps Coda really did create them in isolation. The Great and Lovely Descent. March 20th. Okay, so we are going, it seems, in order. Okay. The Great and Lovely Descent. Let's talk about video game development for a second. Every video game runs on what's called an engine, which determines what the game can and cannot do. So in other words, the engine is a set of tools for game development. 
To make all of these games, Coda is using an engine called Source. Like all engines, Source has certain things that it does well, and it has certain things that it does poorly. One of the things that it does very well is boxy linear corridors. That's why so many of Coda's games are set in these large, flat, empty rooms, is just because he's working with what the engine does well. Yeah, and he's reusing the tools I mean, available is... to the creator shape what kinds of creative work they're going to end up making. You might consider paying attention to the architecture in Coda's games to notice how they seem to stem from an engine that's very good at producing linear boxy corridors. Right, and so then in that way, is this an actual representation of what it is that Coda wanted to create, or is it the closest he could get using the tools that he had? and the ability that he had at the time. So perhaps this isn't exactly the way that he wanted this house to look, but because of the limitations of the medium he was using, it's as close as it could get. And perhaps there wasn't satisfaction there. Maybe there was. Maybe he looked at this and said, this is good enough. Maybe he looked at this and said, well, if I can't quite get what I want, then I'm going to move on. We are seeing a level of, I guess, what in my judgment we would say is improvement in the sense that these are not as boxy. He's created something that's got a lot more value and uh, texture and dimension to it. But it's like, so is this better? Or is it just a mastery of the actual medium itself? And in that way, is this even potentially a window into Coda because perhaps he would have liked to have worked with something else that would have represented it entirely better. And this is nothing like what he wanted us to see. So this is then, does this then become a reflection of Coda or a reflection of the engine itself? The reason that I ask all these questions and I'm highlighting all these things is not to sound like Mr. Socrates smart guy. I ask these questions because I think fundamentally what this experience is reflecting is the idea that we never have the entire picture of something. The only we don't even have the entire picture of ourselves. I can't remember every single moment of my life up until this point. I have forgotten more of my life than I remember. And so have so many of us, the overwhelming majority of us. We've forgotten more about ourselves than we remember. And so in that way, so much of our understanding of ourselves and things is incomplete. And the best that we can do in order to get as much information as possible is to be curious. But so many of us make assumptions and draw conclusions and miss out on the little nuanced bits of context that help us understand people better. And one of the things that I've come to appreciate about being a therapist is that I am provided with the opportunity to engage that curiosity with people, to sit back and actually learn more about context, their thoughts, their experiences, the things they remember, the things they think they remember, the things they don't remember, and how those things shape and influence the way that they navigate their lives and deem certain things to be problems and other things to be solutions and whatnot. But I will never know a person as well as they know themselves. And I'll never have the full context for anything because we're always wrapped up in our own shit, our own limitations, and the limitations of whatever it is that provided whatever it is in front of us. So now all of a sudden, does this become about Coda? Does this become about a game engine? Does this become about the observer? Does this become about us? Does this become about the fact that we can actually have some sort of machine that can run whatever it is that's being represented to us? Are there things that we're missing? Like it asks all these questions and we desire to maybe know more about it, but we can't have the whole picture here. We don't have the person who created this sitting with us, creating it in the moment with a stream of consciousness to give us the entirety of what their experience is of what has been created. So we have to fill in the gaps. And the more we fill in the gaps, rather than be curious with our own experiences, the more we fall short on understanding each other and various situations. The streetwise fool. Now, 
Where do I go in here? Do I enter the traditional way? Got a rug in here. These were the these tables are made of the same thing the stairs in the parking garage were made out of. A fork and a knife on a on a plate with crumbs on it. I don't know that that's what I'd want to be looking at while I eat, but nice image. Oh, there's an accessible bathroom. Side door. Anything in the back? No. I like this little corner desk thing. Okay. Probably assume is a sink. This is pretty cool the way this has been created. Okay. Oh, that's where that door leads to. Sort of like a kitchen area. Send down. Oh, baby. Ha! <laughs> Do I need to jump? I'm sort of I'm sort of interested to know if I need to jump here. <laughs> oh god, put my destiny parkour skills to the test here. God, the music's so good. Oh boy. Hopefully there's no fall damage. Yeah, there's not. Oh my goodness. The house is up there. I just want to, like, listen to this music when I want to go to bed. It's so calming. I don't like how desolate it is. I want what appear to be like jail cells. Music's getting a little more anxiety inducing.
Oh god. Okay. Can't move. This prison, funny enough, in Coda's original design, the door stayed shut for a full hour before letting you go. If you don't mind, I think we're gonna skip that. <laughs> Another, so again, another example. I mean, I appreciate that too. Sitting here for an hour would have been brutal, but I, there's a pattern that Coda seems to be playing with people's time, or at the very least is creating something that occupies a significant amount of your time if you're going to take it to a certain point. And Davey continues to assume that our time is wasted by those designs and skips us ahead as an example. So, hmm, is it actually boring design? Like if I, I, I could just as well be disappointed if I was like, man, I've been really looking for a jail simulator. Oh man, you're telling me I have to sit behind bars for an hour and I can't do anything? And then Davey opens the cage? Again, if I'm Coda, I'm like, dude, that's not how I designed. So do you think it's an example of Davey thinking we don't value it the way he appears to? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Davey is, he is assuming that we, he is assuming that we don't find sitting in this cell for an hour interesting enough to stay engaged with the game that we need to be rushed forward in order to continue our journey, in order to have a level of investment in Coda that he does. Perhaps he's worried that if we were forced to play a game where we have to walk through a labyrinth, walk slowly upstairs, sit for an hour in a jail cell, that we're not gonna join him on his crusade to learn more about his friend. But in so doing that, we're not learning as much about his friend because there might be something to something to be said about the fact that Coda has created these games that take a significant amount of time with seemingly mundane tasks. And if his intention behind these was to slow people down and to get them to appreciate whatever it is that he wants them to appreciate, Davy negating that in his attempts to get us to understand Coda suggests that maybe even Davy believes that Coda is boring in some way or that his designs are boring. Boring. Did Davy sit in the jail cell for an hour in order to learn about what was going to happen and perhaps nothing happened and now he skips us ahead? He didn't tell us that. So we don't know if we're missing something within the design. What we now know is that in three straight games, it's been modified by Davey to make it more palatable to us, or at least palatable to what Davey thinks is palatable to us. Because it very well could be that the thing that's palatable to me is Coda's original vision. And Davey's taking that away from me. So is Davey more right in his assessment of these games than the creator is, or am I the one that makes the determination about whether this is something that is meaningful to me or not? At which case, do you give the me, the player, the choice? Do you open the cell early, or do you stay in it for an hour? In this case, I was not given a choice. In the, in the last two, I was given a choice, I, sort of. I was able to go back through the labyrinth if I wanted to, and I was able to walk up the stairs as slowly as I wanted to. But in here, Davy has stripped my choice away. Despite the fact that evidence of the way that I've played the game suggests that I'm going to play it the way that Coda wants me to. Or at least in the way that I deem it to be necessary to play it in order to get my level of fulfillment out of it. But again, if I'm Coda here, I'm frustrated that Davy is forcing people through this more quickly. When he obviously, I mean, there's probably some reason why he designed this to sit in here for an hour.
This is something that he and I used to argue about a lot. You know, whether a game ought to actually be playable, whether it means anything if no one can get through it. And I would always defend that, you know, all this work goes into the game, why not make it playable and accessible? And so we just got into heated arguments over it, and there was one time that after one of these conversations, he went home, and a day or two later, he sent me a zip file entitled Playable Games that was full of hundreds of individual games, each of which was just an empty box that you walked around in and nothing else. Believe me, I played every single one of those just to find out if there was like a gag hidden somewhere. Notice how Davey does not tell us what Coda's argument was. Like when he talks about how they had these heated discussions, Davey shares what his point of view was on this, but did not share with us what Coda said to him. He shared with us what Coda's reaction to was to it was by giving him hundreds of games that were seemingly boring to Davey. But we're not seeing much of Davey's understanding of whatever messages Coda might have been trying to send to him. And I makes me wonder if Coda was trying to tell his friend to slow down. Not everything has to have a broader purpose. Sometimes you can enjoy things for the sake of what they are. Says the person who's been analyzing the shit out of this game that's only supposed to be an hour and a half long. But we don't get to hear that. And that's the kind of thing that you look for when you listen to like when I listen to people, right? Like Davey's telling us all about his argument. Davey has some level of commitment to getting us to buy into his point of view. So is this really about understanding his friend or is this about us agreeing with Davey's assessment of what, of his friend? There wasn't. Yeah, jail cell is as playable as the empty box. Correct. This is playable. I am playing it. So we're not playing something that Davey deems to be satisfactory. Yet somehow as I'm sitting here playing this without any broader expectation of what it's supposed to be and instead with the expectation of I'm just going to explore this for what it is, somehow it makes this game more interesting. So that then speaks to the way in which we actually can bias ourselves and ruin our own experience through the expectations that we bring into something. If I came into this with the expectation that this game is gonna absolutely be blow my mind with action and narrative and complex environments and all sorts of stuff like that, and that's what I need to be entertained, then this is not that, and thus I am disappointed. But I was brought into this with the expectation that these very simple structures are a window into the psyche of a friend that he wants to understand. And so now all of a sudden, we're willing to look at the corners of something that is overtly simple, objectively not that complex relative to video game standards and I'm sitting here looking through every corner trying to understand it I'm seeing it as more interesting because of the fact that there is a meta idea behind this which is understand the creator of it and in some ways understand the observer of the creator and understand myself in the process so expectations make such a huge difference in the very in the ways that we even enjoy these types of things and so perhaps rather than Davey being present with what it is that his friend has created in the way that we are, he finds himself impatient because he's expecting more. Perhaps maybe he thinks that his friend is capable of more as he deems it. And so instead of being satisfied with what his friend created, he's dissatisfied with what his friend hasn't created. In which case, it's an interesting juxtaposition given that in the very first level, Davey said to us, Let's focus on what these games are instead of what they aren't. Yet Davey consistently makes it about what these aren't. There's no such thing as not having expectations, Jinx. There is a such thing as making your expectations more realistic or more open to 
the unknown, which is hard for people to do. Expecting the unknown and expect and changing your expectations instead of expecting the thing to be a certain way, have expectations for yourself relative to that thing. So instead of expecting this game to be complex, make an expectation that you, the player of the game, are going to explore it to its fullest potential. That's another thing, because those are expectations that you can control. It's also kind of like when somebody shows something to somebody who isn't very expressive. It doesn't mean the other person isn't enjoying or getting something out of it when you can't see it the way you expect the interest to look. Exactly. People express those types of things in very different ways. Right? So we take this for what it is, and all of a sudden it becomes more interesting. Rather than, as you say, DL, comparing it to other games or other experiences. Thanks for watching this, by the way. I appreciate so many of you showing some love by supporting these playthroughs. It means a lot. This also brings up a point in the video game. This is why I've stopped watching promotional uh, materials for video games that are coming out. Because so many people get so hyped on teaser trailers because it sets an expectation. And rarely, if ever, do games or anything meet the expectations of the I that are built with idealizations that we create ourselves. When you watch a teaser trailer, you start to extrapolate into all the things that you ideally hope it will be, rather than what it is. And that's in some ways what, if the, uh, the cynic in me says that's what gaming companies are hoping you'll do. They're hoping that you, it's like test driving a car. It's like visualizing yourself in a McLaren. And then, buying a car blindly because you think it's going to be a McLaren and it's not a McLaren. But you've already put yourself in there. You've already visualized it. You've idealized it. So instead, if you stay away from those types of things and then you take things for what they are, you can make a hell of a lot more informed decisions about them, which is why you shouldn't pre-order video games. But that's a whole story for you. That's, that's getting a little too far away from the point of this. But expectations matter a great deal a great deal in the way that we shape our world. And expectations are a thing that you can control. Look at that, there's a whole lot more of those cells in both directions. I mean, I find, I mean, I know that in a lot of my playthroughs, I make a real strong effort to appreciate environments, but despite how simple this is, despite how limiting the engine is, I find these designs and environments to be fascinating and interesting, even though they're more simple, say, than like a Horizon Forbidden West or a God of War Ragnarok. That there's still something really cool about this because this is something that somebody created. There's intention behind it. And we don't necessarily know what that is, but we have the ability to walk through it. And again, part of that is because I didn't come into this with any kind of expectation that this was going to blow my mind. This is with the expectation of I'm going to try to find things within this environment that are interesting for me. And all of a sudden here we are looking at this structure going like, damn, I've spent more time looking around this than I do most gaming environments that are infinitely more complex. It's the puzzle again, with the exact same solution as the last time. Thanks, Davey. Did you tell me that because you want me to move through this more quickly? I'm 
sensing a theme here. There's still no clear indication of what makes this puzzle so special that Coda is going to return to it over and over. But I promise I'll share with you my interpretation very shortly. <laughs> Maybe he's just not that good at making puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> Or perhaps he wants to inspire confidence in the person who's playing their game. Who knows? It's the beauty of it. I mean, Occam's razor, right? Simplest explanation. Oh boy. Sort of uncanny how uh, harsh some of these transitions are because it really does make you forget how you got where you were. This started outside of like this beautiful little coffee shop and then we fell through an abyss, walked through a bunch of jail cells, went outside through this like kind of outside corridor and now here we are in this like control room with the sun out with these, like it's really in interesting to me the way that this is all constructed. Here, Coda begins using a kind of dialogue system that he fashioned out of the engine's chat capabilities. Use the one, two, three buttons on your keyboard to respond. You there, did you come from up above? What was up there? Yes, there was a world stamped with whiteness. Yes, there was an enormous prison I spent hours in. Yes, there were these floating colored blocks. All three of them are true. I didn't spend hours in the in the jail though because old Davy pushed me through it too fast. I'm gonna say floating colored blocks. Well, they weren't even that color. There's a world stamped with whiteness. Huh. Yes, there were these floating colored blocks. That's the world above. You've been there. Now this is important. Did you have to get through a puzzle with two doors and switches? Yes, I did. That was literally the last thing I did before coming here. No, I don't remember having to go through any puzzle. I'd prefer not to tell you. After all, we've only just met. Yes, I did. That is literally the last thing I did before coming in here. Perfect. Now, please tell us how you solved it. Tell us the solution. Tell us how to get to the other side. I don't remember how I solved it. I'm trying to remember, but I can't. I didn't solve it. Someone else let me in. Trust me, you don't want to go over there. None of those are true. Well, I let myself in. Davey told me how to solve the puzzle, but I had already solved the puzzle. And if I was playing the game that Coda created, Davey wouldn't have been a part of it. Like, that's an important thing to remember. Davey is not actually part of the game that Coda created. remember how I saw them trying to remember but I can't you must think harder please try hard to remember it is so important that we get out of here we must escape this prison can you think harder there must be something more please tell us how to reach the end I 
now there's no more dialogue. But a room has opened. Huh. Hello, how did you get here? Was there a puzzle you had to pass through? Yes, do you want to know how to solve it? No, I've been right here this entire time. Yes, do you want me to know, do you want to know how to solve it? No, no, we actually find the black space between the doors to be far more interesting. Have you seen it yet? Why would I care about the space between the doors? Actually, now that you mention it, I remember feeling strange as I passed through it. I don't recall a space between the doors. Actually, now that you mentioned it, I remember feeling strange as I passed through it. Don't think too hard about it. You'll see it again soon. And so we make one last descent down to the final floor of the level. It's a lamppost. Okay, I can't tell you quite why, but for some reason, Coda fixates on this lamppost. It's going to appear at the end of every single one of his games from here on out. I'll tell you what I think. Uh, I think that up to this point, you know, he's been making really strange and abstract games with no clear purpose, and maybe you can only float around in that headspace for so long. Because now he wants something to hold on to. He wants a reference point. He wants the work to be leading to something. He wants a destination, which is what this lamppost is. It's a destination. We're going to see it in the work as well. His games are just going to become a lot more cohesive, a lot more fully developed, with more of a clear idea behind them. And as we go, that idea will get clearer and clearer and clearer. Just ask your friend what the lamppost means, dude. <laughs> I cannot stress enough how important it is to engage curiosity over assumption when you have the opportunity to do so. If a person is available to you, to get more information from, get the information from them. And if they don't want to give it to you, then you have to respect the boundary. And then be careful not to overload and compensate with your assumptions. The, I, I will say that maybe one point I want to make here is that this is the kind of thing that people go through when people they love die. Because that person is no longer available to you to give their perceptions or intentions or perspective on the things that they brought themselves to. And part of the grief process for many, uh, both immediately and long into the future, is having to sit with the fact that they will never get that information. And it's, uh, many times people will start to make assumptions that may or may not be true. It's impossible to speak for the dead. Uh, but it makes these things complicated because Davy doesn't have this information. Instead of going and getting it from Coda, he's trying to extrapolate a whole bunch of information from his creations. And that's why I said this game in some ways feels like a giant boundary violation because perhaps Coda, that's not something Coda wants. Or perhaps Coda doesn't believe that these are any kind of representation of anything other than just his desire to create certain games. 
with certain assets. It may not mean much to Coda at all. And so if we walk away from this game thinking we know way more about Coda than we did when we started, we may actually know less because we're making assumptions about him that aren't even true. Which is a real bummer. And that's where we're going to end part one. Thank you so much for taking the time to indulge this playthrough. I hope that you are enjoying it so far. I'm very much going to look forward to playing the next part. Uh, please leave a thumbs up if you've enjoyed this. Leave a comment if there's something you'd like to say about the playthrough or anything that I had to say during it. Um, these are just my thoughts as I play it. Games like this are very cool for massaging the brain, and I enjoy that exercise immensely. So uh, please check out all those links down in the description. Come hang out with us live sometime. I'd love to see you. Check out my other playthroughs. If you're binging this, I'll see you over in part two. And if you're waiting for the next one to come out, I will get it out to you as soon as I can. Y'all are fantastic, and I will see you in the next one.